It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker this evening, Dr. Will Fenton. Dr. Fenton is a program officer at the Office of Challenge Programs, where he administers the American Rescue Plan, Humanities Grant Making, and Digital Infrastructure Programs, uh, and that's all at the National Endowment for the Humanities. Prior to joining uh, the NEH, uh, Fenton served as Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. He earned his PhD at a great Jesuit institution uh, at Fordham University, specializing in early American literature and the digital humanities. Fenton has developed a series of digital humanities projects, including the online research guide diaries held at the American Philosophical Society, the digital exhibit Americanization Then and Now, and Digital Paxton, a scholarly edition, digital collection, and teaching platform devoted to the 1763 massacre, pa uh, Paxton massacres, and um, in, uh, in an, an ensuing pamphlet war. In his most recent project, Ghost River, The Fall and Rise of the Conestoga, he collaborated with a Na Native American artist, author, publisher, and printer to develop an educational graphic novel and public art exhibition uh, that forwards the experience of Lenape victims, survivors, and kin from those tragedies. The project was awarded a 2021 Leadership in History Award by the American Association for State and Local History. It's my pleasure to introduce Will Fenton. Will? Thank you for that generous introduction, Tom. And thank you, Emily, for helping to um, facilitate this event. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I feel like I've had these slides for, oh my goodness, at least a year, maybe it was two years I was supposed to do this. And then, um, you know, the world interrupted. Um, but I am so excited to be here with you today, even if it's virtually, because Lancaster has such an important role in this story. Uh, it was instrumental to the creation of this graphic novel, including some of your individuals in this community. And um, I'm just happy to bring it back and um, to help tell the story that Weshoyo and Lee have really seen forward in this beautiful graphic novel. So uh, the title of this talk is From Colonial Past to Native Present, and you'll sort of see the bifurcation that happens here, the tension that uh, emerges in this talk, because on one hand, I'll be talking a lot about the 18th century, and I'll be geeking out a little bit, so I hope you'll forgive it. But at the same time, I'm going to hopefully um, really convey that there are Indigenous people here today. Um, they're still here. They're all around us, and they were instrumental in creating this story and helping us to remember it. And so this project is very much indebted, responsible to those Native peoples. Um, so I really hope that that can be conveyed. Now, normally when I give a talk about Ghost River, I have to do a lot of background on the Paxton incident, but uh, you folks, um, you're a special audience, so I suspect I can go a little bit lighter on my touch this time. But to give you just the, the aerial view here, imagine it is um, the late fall, early winter of you know, November, December, 1763, um, there has been a lot of violence in Pennsylvania, almost a decade of war, renewed fights um, that made it all the way into Pittsburgh area with Pontiac's war that summer. Um, and there are a lot of former militiamen floating around uh, because again, Pennsylvania was an all volunteer militia. It didn't have a standing militia because it was a Quaker colony by tradition. And so some of these former militiamen um, from the Paxton Township, hence the name Paxton Boys, I'm gonna call them the Paxton Vigilantes because I don't wanna you know, treat them as boys here. Um, they decided that they wanted to attack the Conestoga people, uh, which lived on a reservation that had been set aside by William Penn with the very founding of Pennsylvania. Um, Conestoga Indian Town was set on Conestoga Manor. Um, it goes right back to the beginning, and it's not far from Lancaster today. Um, and one of the more rewarding experiences of this project was getting a tour of it with uh, Daryl Martin, who helped us to really get a sense of the place and just how close it was. And um, Conestoga, the Conestoga people were a diverse group of indigenous peoples. They were a mixed group. They were um, what you would call Christian or praying Indians. A lot of them were Christianized. A lot of them spoke English, had English names, wore English dress. They traded, they intermarried, they moved away. 
And so when this story often gets told of the Paxton massacre, it's treated as an ending, as genocide, as the very end of the Conestoga people. When I think that that's actually not really accurate because so many of the Conestoga people had moved west or intermarried or moved away. But there were 20 people remaining on this reservation in these Paxton vigilantes, which started as a group of about 50, um, decided that they were going to attack it because they feared that they were somehow um, conspiring with um, uh, the sort of um, you know, native peoples that they had fought uh, in, in uh, Pontiac's war and uh, certainly in the seven years war before it. Um, and you know, frankly, there's not a lot of truth to that. Um, the, 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 the Conestoga were by all accounts neutral in that war, if not in some instances sympathetic to the colonists. Uh, they were unarmed and they were attacked and murdered in cold blood. And there were two separate events, actually three, but we'll start with the first two. The, 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 uh, the uh, first attack was at Conestoga Indian Town uh, where the Paxton vigilantes attacked and murdered six Conestoga people. Uh, the remaining 14 were taken into Lancaster where they were kept in the workhouse or jail um, for their supposed protection. And two weeks later, um, on, let's make sure I get this date right, December 27th, so that's two days after Christmas, the Paxton mob descends on that jail and murders the remaining uh, 14 Conestoga. And notably, of those 14 Conestoga, it was six adults and eight children. Um, so naturally, the word of this uh, finds its way back to Philadelphia, where the seat of government is, where the proprietors live, and they are very concerned about this starting another war. Um, and so they take into Philadelphia, basically because they have no other option, no one else wants them, 140 Moravian Lene Lenape Indians. And the Paxtons vow to march on Philadelphia. So this is the part of the story that typically gets documented in the printed materials uh, that um, uh, continue to be available. Um, the Paxton March on Philadelphia and the forming of a militia and the leading of a delegation by Benjamin Franklin. Now, of course, this isn't actually in Philadelphia. The Paxtons were stopped in Germantown, which is about six miles north of Philadelphia. And for what it's worth, the Lene Lenape, who they had vowed to inspect, were nowhere near center city near um, the market that's being shown in this interior view um, by Henry Dawkins. Um, but they were ultimately dispersed because there was a militia and they were um, uh, encouraged to publish their grievances. And for his part, Benjamin Franklin put out his own narrative of what he calls the late massacres and the Paxtons put out their plea um, for greater representation in government and justification for their conduct in what is called Declaration and Remonstrance. And I believe that there's an early draft of that at Lancaster History. So that's worth checking out. This started what is called the Paxton Pamphlet War. This is the first major pamphlet war in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. And that is, you know, really the center of print culture in the colonies, maybe with the you know, exception of Boston. Um, these pamphlets were very numerous. They were quickly produced. Uh, they were hard to attribute because a lot of them were published anonymously or under pseudonyms. Um, they were often nested within one another. And, um, you know, frankly, there was a lot of fake news in these pamphlets. This, this was the social media <laughs> of the 1760s, and it was everywhere. Something like one fifth of all printed material in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania had a ton of printed material, but one fifth of that printed material in 1764 concerned the Paxton affair. So this was a huge debate. And it was a predominantly colonial debate. It was predominantly a debate that happened around Third Street in Philadelphia where all the printers were. But certainly there are pamphlets that were authored and that circulated from Lancaster. Um, this is what got me interested in it. I discovered the Paxton incident through the pamphlet war, which I discovered through a very dated edition um, called uh, The Paxton Papers by John Rain Dumbart. It's about 60 years old now. And that curated about 28 of these pamphlets, but just the full text. So you just got the text. Um, and when I started to work with these materials as a scholar, I found that there was a lot more uh, to appreciate. And as a lit scholar, I was particularly excited about um, the sort of generic experimentation. I mean, you have everything from poems to plays to rebuttals 
to dialogues, debates, conversations, every kind of form of debate is being mobilized in this. And there's all sorts of really rich material culture that's being brought into it as well. So um, just to linger on this for one more moment before I jump to the project that documents it. Notably, as I mentioned, Benjamin Franklin gets caught up in this and it does not redound to his success. It actually costs him his assembly seat. And um, by all accounts, the Paxtons and their allies um, kind of win the day. Um, they picked up seats in the elections that year. Um, and, you know, frankly, a lot of their priorities, which included indigenous dispossession and westward conquest, really became the spirit of the law. So this is a real turning point in the colony of Pennsylvania, which had had a long diplomatic history really grounded in those Quaker roots. I developed digital Paxton to basically show my work. I was working with these materials, but I knew a lot of them weren't easily accessible. Not everybody can go and spend time in archives and libraries. I mean, you guys have a wonderful uh, Lancaster history available to you, um, but not everybody has that. So my goal was to digitize the materials that were first available at the Library Company of Philadelphia and the neighboring Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And why those two collections? Well, the library company, that is Benjamin Franklin's library. Um, so it has a ton of printed material from the 18th century, and it had the vast majority of the pamphlets that were previously studied, including many others that are sort of overlooked. The Historical Society also has its own collections, which in many ways are really well um, aligned, but also complementary to what the library company had. So it started with digitizing those materials, not just capturing the full text, but capturing the actual materials so that people could get a sense of what they look like. Um, and then it eventually grew to include other materials from other collections, as well as contextual uh, materials that included essays from other scholars, be they historians, art historians, lit scholars, and educators, both at a high school and a university level. So Digital Paxton, it's still going today. I'm still keeping it up to date. Um, it's a great place to get lost. Um, you know, there is a wonderful trove of data there, a uh, trove of, of, of resources. But again, it's designed to be capacious. It is not thesis driven by any stretch of the imagination. It's trying to collect everything and to make it widely available. And um, as I suggested, this is a project that grew well beyond the Library Company and Historical Society of Pennsylvania, those founding partners. It came to include the Moravian Archives of Bethlehem. I'll show you an asset from them later. Lancaster History, I'll show you an asset from them later. Um, and certainly Penn State archives and other smaller regional archives that people just don't make it to. Um, so I really do hope that this helps expand the conversation, um, broaden the conversation about this important incident. Um, as I mentioned, you know, these pamphlets, they're not just text. As you can see here, they often included woodcuts and engravings, um, uh, and they're often super meta. <laughs> they're referring to other people that you really have to like be submerged in 18th century culture to know who's being parodied. Uh, also a number of political cartoons, nine of which are available at the library company and several at the um, Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And then finally, and this isn't really doing it justice, these proclamations, these broadsides, these big, um, posters that would have been uh, printed and hung in taverns and uh, coffee houses all around the colony that were produced by the proprietors. So there's a lot of different types of texts floating around and they're all sort of interrelated and you really have to spend some time figuring out how they're connected and how they're disconnected. But you know, really the more work I did on this, the more I came to um, really value correspondence, uh, diaries, treaty maps, really the manuscript records, because those give you a sense of what everyday people were thinking, people that didn't have access to a printing press. So that print debate that I spoke to that's so well studied, so well documented, um, because it's structurally well suited to that, that gives you a really great sense of what's happening in the metropolis, right? It doesn't give you a good sense of what's happening in the borderlands or what was then called the back country uh, where these Paxtons came from. It doesn't give you a sense of what indigenous people and their allies were thinking and saying and writing. So that's where these materials are really illuminating. And to give you a couple of examples, let me start with um, a diary. This is George Mason as in Mason Dixon, right? That guy. Um, uh, Lancaster history has a diary from him uh, that's a year after. It's from January 10th, 1765. And he's actually reflecting on Lancaster and the Paxton affair. And he writes, they, that being the Conestoga, had received notice of the intention of some of the back inhabitants 
that being the Paxtons, and fled into the jail to save themselves. The keeper made the door fast, but it was broken open, and two men went in and executed the bloody scene while about 50 of their party sat on horseback without, armed with guns. Strange it was that the town, though as large as most market towns in England, never offered to oppose them. Though it's more than probable they, on request, might have been assisted by a company of His Majesty's troops who were there in town. No honor to them. So this is easy to write, of course, a year after the fact, but I think there's a couple of important details here. One, you get a sense of what's happening in the moment on December 27th, uh, when the Paxtons are moving on the remaining 14 Conestoga at Lancaster, in the Lancaster jail, now the Fulton Theater. Um, and, you know, frankly, it's a contested account. Other accounts have this happening actually in the courtyard behind um, the Lancaster jail but it still gives you a sense that this is a massacre. It is a bloody scene. And it also draws attention to the fact that it was largely unopposed. Um, you know, that, you know, the majesty's troops were not marshaled. And this also draws into a thread of something that becomes really dominant in the print debate. And that is that, you know, Benjamin Franklin and some of his allies start to say, well, if the proprietors can't provide for the safety and security of Pennsylvania, maybe they don't deserve you know, a position of governance. Maybe we need to royalize the colony. So you're getting some intimations of that debate in this particular uh, diary record. And that is, of course, at Lancaster history. Another example uh, from Pennsylvania State Archives is from Jacob Whistler. He was the caretaker of Conestoga Manor. So remember, Conestoga Indian Town was based on Conestoga Manor, a plot of land set aside by William Penn with the founding of Pennsylvania. This violence, all of this brutal um, uh, attack happens at the very end of December. And then in January, February, the Paxtons are marching across the state to Philadelphia. Here it is, a couple months later, April 9th, 1764, and we have this letter from Jacob Whistler to a friend, William Peters in Philadelphia. And he writes, there is already two families living on said land and a third is already plowing. I forewarned them of the land and the answer was that they had possession and would keep it and would lose their lives before they would be turned off the land. They care for no governor, sheriff, nor any other officer and will allow no other person or persons to settle there without themselves. The above Robert Bow is relation to the Scots family in Donegal. Um, so first things important, that last sentence, that connects this family to the very leaders of the Paxton massacres. And furthermore, it also shows that they were moving on to the very land that they had evacuated with the massacre just a few months after it. This draws a complete contrast to the sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, rich sort of democratic yearnings that they portray in their declaration and in remonstrance. In that, they're really contesting the fact that the Quakers have not provided for their safety and security, that they aren't represented in Philadelphia and that their conduct is thus justified. And this manuscript, this letter really gives a sense that it's a land grab, it's right of conquest. Um, so those other things might well be true, but there's also a right of conquest being pursued here. Finally, one more example. This is a really special one because this is actually originally a very messy handwriting in German maintained by a Moravian missionary. Um, and fortunately, the good folks at Moravian Archives at Bethlehem had it transcribed and translated. So it's actually really easy to use and it's all available on digital Paxton now. And this is a record of the Moravian missionaries who accompanied the Lenny Lenape in their internment in Philadelphia. And when I say Philadelphia, I'm taking a really capacious view of Philadelphia. They were actually originally interned at Province Island in the pest house, so way down. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a squalid little shack where today you would find the Philadelphia airport. And then between January and February, they were relocated to the Philadelphia barracks in Northern Liberty. It's not exactly a great time to make a move. Um, and so one of these missionaries writes, we set out again on our travels because the river was frozen. We went over the ice, the sick and blind, as well as uh, senior group were brought over with a hand sled. Mr. Billisco, who carries our passport, that being a passport for travel, would have soon lost his horse if our Indians had not come to our help. On this side of the river, we heard much bad talk from the people. 
the people there being Philadelphians. And this, I think, really contests the notion that um, you know, these Native peoples were welcomed in Philadelphia. Sometimes the Paxton allies, um, or Paxton apologists for that matter, sort of critique all of the Quaker influence in Philadelphia and suggest that you know, the, their allegiance is more to Native peoples than to their fellow white settlers. And um, you can get a sense here of the texture of that experience. They are isolated, they're struggling, there's sickness, there's death, and um, you know, this, this internment lasts almost an entire year, um, which also gets lost in that print debate. So this brings us really to what I see as the limits of digital packs, and it's really right there in the name. Um, while this digital edition encompasses lots of different materials, including those treaty minutes and correspondence and diaries, and it elevates them, it puts them alongside those colonial records, there just aren't that many indigenous records. They haven't been systematically collected through time. Um, so we can get a sense of what the experience is like, but if we're just trying to tell it through the archival materials, we reach real limitations. And so this problem that I started to, you know, really start to work through back in like 2017, 2018 was what if instead of trying to tell this story about the Paxton murderers as a, you know, <laughs> encompassed in the digital Paxton name, we tried instead to tell the story about the Conestoga, and their kin in Pennsylvania, because frankly, this is their story. They are at the center of it. This is really the germ of Ghost River, the fall and rise of the Conestoga. And I'll be speaking about this mostly as a book, be it a print edition or a digital edition, but it's actually comprised of a number of different components. The four main components are first and I think foremost, really um, a teacher seminar um, in the summer of 2019. Uh, the library company worked with the University of Pennsylvania and the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History to convene 35 public school teachers from all across the country. And those teachers basically got a crash course in settler colonial theory. But really, you know, to, to, to concretize this, they, they learned about like the history of Pennsylvania and the Seven Years' War and the Paxton incident. And they got to see early pages of the graphic novel and they became some of our best ambassadors for this project. They've actually helped me art to articulate why it's important. Um, and then we had a public art exhibition at the library company. And this, I think it's worth noting, you know, the library company is one of the oldest colonial institutions in America. It is almost 300 years old. It is a library founded by Benjamin Franklin. It is a library that doubled in size because it got a bunch of collections from James Logan, um, you know, as a, you know, James Logan who profited from you know, the walking purchase. So this is the Ur Colonial Institution. And this was, as far as I know, the institution's first native art exhibition. It put Weshoyo Albitre's beautiful artwork, which you'll see more of in the coming minutes, um, in juxtaposition with those collections. Um, and it even had a documentary film that we created with some documentarians from Mangrove Media that really sort of helps to unpack a lot of that story. And then of course, the emphasis of today um, and what I think you're all most interested in because it's most accessible, it's, it's, it's the graphic novel. And that is a graphic novel that was written, illustrated, published and actually incidentally even printed by our native partners. Um, and that book is available uh, for sale at Lancaster History, I'm very proud to report. It's also available online at Red Planet Books and Comics, the publisher. And it's finally available for free um, also uh, in, through that digital edition, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And I wanna underscore that all of this, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the people that made this possible, but there were also a lot of institutions that made this possible. And that includes institutions like Lancaster History where we did a site visit at the beginning of this process, American Philosophical Society which shared their wampum, uh, Library Company, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and of course, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, which funded this crazy thing. Um, so um, this is a story of institutions and people trying to do good work. So when it comes to those people, I want to give you just an oversight, sort of an overview of some of the, the various constituencies that really made this possible. First, we had an advisory board, and this was really me just trying to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, you know, I, I have and expertise in early America, but there's plenty that I don't know. And I also wanna make sure that I'm connecting with everybody that I should. So we had folks from Gilder Lerman, uh, Ron Nash, who was instrumental in making that seminar possible. 
Joel Nichols helped connect us with the free library where the book's now circulating. Um, he also made it possible for us to partner up with One Book, One Philadelphia. Um, Tommy Orange is there, there was a really great companion to Ghost River. Uh, Vilma Ortiz Sanchez at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian was crucial for connecting us with native partners. Dan Richter, um, who just recently retired as the director of the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, was an incredibly generous reader of this project and really helped us keep us really clear on the historiography. And last but certainly not least is Curtis Zuniga of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. He's also the co-director of the Lenape Center in Manhattan. And he was absolutely invaluable in connecting us with um, uh, native oral histories and also with living descendants and community members that would help us to shape this project. And that really began with the Circle Legacy Center, um, a local indigenous community group that um, I believe still meets in the Methodist church there in Lancaster. And they were incredibly generous at the very outset of this project. We did a potluck with them. And I think it really uh, was absolutely formative for Weshoyo and Lee. Um, the educators uh, at the Giller Lerman Institute, I've already um, highlighted, uh, they were not only um, incredibly inquisitive, but they asked really good questions that actually had an effect on the book. And then we had lots of outside readers, and there's just one that I want to call attention to because he's such a local, um, uh, Jack Brubaker. He wrote the book on this incident, Massacre of the Conestogas, and he was one of our most generous readers throughout this process. So I'm, I'm really indebted to him. So the graphic novel, when I'm talking about the graphic novel, um, it is really split in two. You have the graphic novel and you have all the context that's intended to support it because we don't want to just throw this out there. It's a really difficult story. It was notably published by Red Planet Books and Comics. Um, it was first published in December of 2019, but then we actually did a second edition about a year later because we had exhausted all 2,500 copies. So that's a good problem to have. It also allowed me to catch a couple of typos that somehow made it through the copyright, the, the uh, copy editing phase. Um, Red Planet Books and Comics, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a wonderful comic book shop and a publisher for Native folks that really want to take control of their representation in graphic arts, in comic books. It's done really great work. It's led by Dr. Lee Francis IV of the Laguna Pueblo, who is an incredible writer in his own right but he's also a great systematic thinker. He is the founder of Indigenous Comic-Con, uh, which is where I met him in Weshoyo, out in Albuquerque in its second year. And Indigenous Comic-Con is special because if Red Planet Books and Comics is the publishing arm that allows Native folks to sort of um, take control of their representations, uh, Indigenous Comic-Con is where they build relationships. They build the kinds of relationships they need to make those books. And then it was hand-painted artwork. All of this is hand-painted and then scanned by Weshoyo Alvitre of the Tongva people um, out in Los Angeles. Weshoyo was an incredible artist. She does painstaking research and work. She learned about 18th century pigmentation before she even started putting pen to page. Um, she was deeply influenced and deeply curious about all of how um, the archival materials could find their way into the book, as I'll show you in a little later. And uh, she has great experience bringing history to life. She's done great work with the Smithsonian um, and she really gets it on a visceral level. Um, so it's unfortunate that she can't be here with me today um, uh, singing the praises of this process. And then, you know, when, I, when, I, when I, we speak about the interpretive materials, this includes artist statements from both of them, uh, reproductions of all the primary sources, because again, this is all grounded in 18th century, even some 19th century, uh, material. Um, a teacher's unit that was developed by the experts at Gilder Lerman to be nested right inside the book. So that's everything you need to bring it into a high school classroom. Some contextual essays from our outside, read from, from our outside readers. And then um, the annotated script. And the annotated script, I think, is really worth you know, showing for a moment um, because it gives you a sense of the process through which we made decisions. So every conversation that we had be it through emails, uh, through chat services, even you know, phone calls. I tried to transcribe them, collect them, so that you could see the conversations we had about every choice we made in this graphic novel. And it goes page by page. Um, so not only do you get to see the graphic novel in its various iterations from thumbnails to pencils to inks to painted pages, but you also get to see like 
who we consulted with, when we consulted with them, what questions they raised and how we dealt with challenges as they arose. Because again, this is about really showing our work and being forthright that we're working through this and it's often difficult because there are gaps in the record and we're trying to make the best choices we possibly can. Um, you've already seen that, that first image. I think it was associated with this event. It's important because this is where the graphic novel starts. It starts at the beginning. That is the Lenape origin story of Turtle Island. It's actually a, a myth that was shared by a number of Haudenosaunee peoples. So it's a powerful image that's sort of synthetic for pan-Indigenous identity, but it's also high, highly localized. When Weshoya was working on this, she was doing research into the petroglyphs on the Susquehanna. And she's integrated some of those petroglyphs into the background of this beautiful spread that opens the graphic novel. Um, it took her about two weeks for this one page. So it's a remarkable amount of work that she's done here. But you'll also see that it's not just about the 18th century. Um, it's not just about the distant past. This is a graphic novel that moves in a sort of elliptical way. Um, and it brings you forward and backward in time. And it brings you all the way up to the present. And that includes our very conversations about the graphic novel and how we were going to create it. Um, so, you know, in that second image, that's actually an aerial view <laughs> of the print department at the library company. That long table has the political cartoons spread out in front of us. And there we are having a conversation about what we're seeing and why it's difficult or how to interpret it. Because again, we want to invite people into that interpretive process. You know, by no means is there just one interpretation of these materials. I think what's also really powerful about this graphic novel is how Weshoyo and Lee have dealt with the violence that you can't get away from in this story. This is, this is, a, this is a terrible tragedy. Um, and in addition to sort of narratively opening the aperture so that it, it, in, it includes living Native peoples, um, which I think is poignantly dealt with in the reading of the names, a ceremony that happened in Lancaster uh, in 2013. Um, in addition to that, it, it deals with the 18th century violence in some really, I think, ingenious ways. Um, you know, Lee was really committed to not naming the Paxton vigilantes, deprioritizing them as much as possible and humanizing the Conestoga as best he could. Um, but you'll see that Weshoyo also came up with really beautiful artistic ways. Here she's embedded the violence on Conestoga Indian Town in wampum, wampum being this crucial, you know, quahog carved shell that was instrumental to diplomacy, to trade, to the economy, to the way of life. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite literally in the hands of a Native woman. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really powerful way. And you could see she was trying to work through how to depict this. In the early pencils, you could see her trying to figure out how to show the violence without it necessarily, um, you know, becoming fetishized, which is so often the case with Native uh, stories. And she wound up throwing that away and going in a totally different direction, which I think is, is really powerful. Um, and you know, finally, I want to come over to the digital edition because this is something that you can all enjoy right now from your computers and you can share with your friends and colleagues. Um, we initially hadn't really budgeted for much of a digital edition, and it was really because of the foresight of a couple of people on staff. I'd love to take credit, but it was really Anne McShane and Nicole Scalessa that said, we should have a good digital edition because frankly, what happens if we can't get the books out to all of the, you know, the tribes, for example, that we want to reach? We knew that we were going to be shipping these out to every federally recognized tribe, but we also knew that, you know, like things happen. Um, and also whatever you create that's online needs to be pretty accessible, like pretty low maintenance. You need to offer things in a lot of different ways. So this makes the entire graphic novel and everything that's contained around it available in a format that hopefully is widely accessible. It's not just screen reader accessible for those that are vision impaired, um, but it also includes like different permutations of the graphic novel. So there's a rich web edition, but then there's also just like the version that you can download and put on your Kindle, an EPUB file or a PDF, because again, we wanna meet people where they are. Perhaps, you know, most significantly, it includes both the documentary, which I think has some amazing footage about the research process we went through, um, as well as all of the content that the teachers from that Gilder Lerman's Institute had contributed. And mind you, those teachers, they were not obligated to produce those lesson plans. They did so out of their own generosity 
and their own investment in the project. So there are about a dozen lesson plans created by those teachers that have been integrated into the digital edition that frankly aren't available in the book because you know they weren't available at the time of printing. So I think that this is a powerful resource and I hope that you use it and share it. You know, to give you a better sense of exactly how much um, the materials and um, the, the scenery sort of influenced it, I'm, uh, um, the, the, the production of the book, I wanted to give you some early pages where you could see even at the beginning when um, Weshoyo is working through her ink work, she is integrating um, archival materials that we had looked at. And so before she renders them herself, you could see she's actually like photoshopping in those cartoons that she wants to work with. Um, and so you all could see that, you know, really that, that the, those visits to American Philosophical Society, to the Library Company, to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, to Lancaster history were really integral to the narrative and they find their way in. And all of those materials, of course, are reproduced in the back of the book and made accessible through the digital edition. Another example here, is how like the palette and the scenery of Lancaster sort of finds its way into this book. You can see the longhouse, that's the Hans Herr longhouse. I believe the name might've changed, but when we visited it, it was you know a really important moment for Weshoyo and Lee when they were thinking about the Conestoga, how they lived, the kinds of communities they had. Uh, Weshoyo in particular is coming in from Los Angeles where it's extremely arid, very dry. And so all of the greens, find their way into the artwork. So, you know, the experience of, of spending time out in Lancaster, uh, where Conestoga Indian Town would have been, walking around Old Town Philadelphia, all of this really finds a voice in the graphic novel. And this is the kind of project that you just couldn't have done remotely. So, you know, it's, it's very lucky that we started it when, when, uh, when uh, we did. I wanna close with just um, a few calls to action. Um, first and foremost, uh, if you're interested in the book, and I think it's a nice size, this is what it's like. Um, you can pick it up at Lancaster History. Um, if they run out of copies or if you need to get one online, uh, Lee has them at Red Planet Books and Comics, which you can order online. Uh, you know, of course, ghostriver.org is ready-made to share with a friend. Um, we promote it at every chance we get. We want people to use it. We want people to steal it. Um, we were really delighted when um, in his uh, recent documentary on, um, on uh, Benjamin Franklin, um, Ken Burns actually borrowed a few pages from Ghost River when he was showing the Paxton incident. We don't care if there's attribution or not. Like, we're just happy to see it get out there. We're happy to see people learn about this story. Um, certainly, if you're a scholar, or you have an interest in this or some kind of deep expertise in it, or if you're a teacher, um, we're still open for business when it comes to context. Um, I am a maximalist when it comes to context. So if you want to submit a lesson plan or a contextual essay, uh, both of those can live on in both Digital Paxton and Ghost River, both sites that I try to actively maintain. And then, you know, finally, um, Lee and Weshoyo, they are the busiest, um, uh, you know, most innovative people I've met in a long time. Uh, they're always doing something. They're always working on amazing projects. Weshoyo just started another beautiful, beautiful project. And what's great about both of them is that they document a lot of their work as it's unfolding using social media. So if you're on Twitter or Instagram, you can follow them uh, using the handles below and get a sense of what they're working on as it's unfolding. But of course, it also gives you a sense of what you, what, uh, what, uh, you can support. So if there's something there that you really like, I encourage you to go out and buy a copy of it because they are both working artists and they are doing their very best. But you know, comics, graphic novels, it is a big competitive business and they can use all the support they can get. So. Um, with that, um, I want to open it up so that we have plenty of time for questions. Wow, Will, thank you. Uh, just a, a kind of a mind-blowing experience to uh, approach the whole history of the Conestoga, the Lenape from this vantage point. Um, I think it's probably new to a lot of our um, viewers tonight and uh, folks who, who think uh, about this story, who are familiar with the story. 
One of the things I want to commend you for right off the bat is dispelling the myth that with the Conestoga massacres, all the Conestoga are gone, that they're wiped off the face of the earth. And, and for a long time, that was a traditional trope that we heard uh, here in Lancaster and I'm sure in other regions too. But I think what you've done is you've helped restore them to the center of the story um, and you've helped to remind others that uh, that the Conestoga are still with us, um, and it may take you know greater exploration or more openness to understanding that and and finding those of uh, those people. Um, I'm familiar certainly with Circle Legacy. I'm, I'm delighted that that you uh, were connected to them in the process. Seeing Dan Richter's name up there. Uh, always instills great confidence in me. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank you for that kind of uh, uh, setting to rest that myth that uh, the Conestoga are gone. Thank They're you. not. Um, the whole notion of a graphic novel is, is intriguing to me. Um, as a child, I certainly grew up with, uh, with comic books. Uh, so they were a part of my experience, but I left that behind long ago and typically have thought of the graphic novel as something that is for young kids. But uh, what I'd love to hear is a little bit of your experience at this intersection of history and graphic novel. Um, has it resulted in bringing in new audiences? Has it been able to attract a youthful audience? Have you reminded adults of the kind of graphic experience they've had in their past. So if you could just talk a little bit about that nexus of graphic novel and, and American history. Yeah, so the choice of a graphic novel was, was, was a leap for me because I actually didn't read a lot of graphic novels growing up. I got really interested in them sort of pedagogically, you know, in terms of like how they could open this up. But, you know, the other part of this was if the problem is that there aren't textual records that give voice to the Conestoga people, moving towards something that's imagistic is almost a corrective. You know, it pushes back against that reliance on text, on text, which, you know, as a lit scholar, that's 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 something I care a lot about. That's sort of my bread and butter. But you know, the the core aim of the Ghost River project as we presented it to Pew and and, and that I think we were faithful to was we want to jailbreak this story from the rarefied circles of the academy, you know, because if you're going to a McNeil event, everybody knows the Paxton incident. They could probably, you know, name a couple of pamphlets. They could talk about its wide ranging effects, but it just doesn't get out. And, you know, when I was visiting with folks at the Circle Legacy Center and even talking to some teachers out in Lancaster, it's very clear that, you know, like this isn't known history um, it, it, or at least not widely known and it's not systematically taught. And so the goal was like, let's get something out that actually feels, um, uh, you know, accessible to somebody who is maybe between eighth grade and 12th grade. And it turns out, you know, as we've learned more from the teachers, uh, the Gilder Lerman teachers who have continued to advocate for this graphic novel, um, you know, frankly, there are ways of getting this into much earlier grades. Some of them have gotten into fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. I wouldn't have thought this story would somehow be suitable, but some of those lesson plans have really creative takes. Now, in terms of the pickup, I've been really moved to see um, the book adopted into curricula at various schools. The Shipley in particular has it in their eighth grade curricula now, it's core text. They teach it along with everything else. And um, one of their deans, Mark Statina, who is one of the Gilder Lerman faculty, um, has this amazing lesson plan where he has them read the graphic novel, close read the political cartoons that appear in the graphic novel, and then he asks the students to create their own political cartoons. So it's both interpretive and creative, and they're engaging with both primary source texts and secondary source texts. Um, so it's really great to see that kind of you know, example. And um, Lee and Weshoyo and myself, we probably do an event with a class every month or every other month. Um, we have you know, teachers that reach out and say, this book's really cool. Would you be willing to talk to my students? So again, I don't have data and I'm certainly not in this for the money, um, but you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really heartened to see 
that continued interest because one of my concerns when we were working on this graphic novel and right after we put it out and then everything shuts down in March of 2020 was this is going to stop in its tracks. It's going to kill the project. But that's where that digital edition that Nicole Scalessa and Anne McShane had really advocated for was instrumental. That then became the interface. That became the thing that we passed along. And that sort of has helped sustain interest throughout the pandemic. And, um, you know, that's, that's, I think, been crucial to the educational pickup as has, you know, um, making it available in like class sets. So we have discounts even for, for teachers that want to pick up 20 copies or something right. at a time. Well, it's just great to know that teachers are becoming aware of this resource and can incorporate it into their, uh, into their curriculum. Uh, certainly there's a direct connection, I think, between uh, the graphic novel and the pamphlet um, wars um, and, and how in the 18th century, image and, and uh, almost comical image or graphic images are used to, to tell stories. I'm kind of struck by um, the, kind, I'd like to hear a little bit about a comparison between pamphlets um, in the 18th century and social media in the 21st century, because we're so accustomed to, you put your message out there and yeah. all of a sudden people jump on it, respond to it, 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 it's such rapid fire exchange of information, sometimes insult, accusation, whatever it might be. But here in the 18th century, you got to come up with the idea, you got to do the drawing, you got to print the thing, you got to get it out. So there's this lag time. Can you talk a little bit about either the similarities or some of the differences between yeah. how we think of social media today and how pamphlets may have functioned as a social media in the 18th century? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. It's, it's something I love to think about given my background in lit studies and book history. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, for the 18th century, pamphlets were darn fast, particularly if they didn't have images. So I've shown a lot with images because I think they're super interesting because the relationship between the image and the text also creates all sorts of interesting questions. But if you were producing a pamphlet that didn't, include images or just gestured towards an image or traded on somebody's knowledge of an image that's already around. You could turn that around in a day. Like these could get turned around really quickly by 18th century standards. And you can tell that sometimes something's being turned around a little too quickly because there are all sorts of typos in it or you know it's misattributing another pamphlet and then it gets corrected in subsequent editions. Um, Again, the first tweet is still there, but you can see the subsequent tweets afterwards where somebody tries to do cleanup. Um, and you know, it's, it's something where everybody is sort of working from an alias. Very few people put their name to it. Um, they're often either anonymous or they're using a pseudonym that they think is clever. And um, you know, frankly, uh, particularly on the Paxton apologist side, they're stirring up stuff, you know? Like they are looking to fracture. They're looking for a wedge issue. They're looking to divide Franklin from the Quakers. They're looking to divide the proprietors from the Quakers, you know? Um, so it is about looking for that next wedge issue and trying to create enough of a schism that suddenly the debate changes. And it does, because in the first couple of months, and you know, this is again, just me spending too much time with these damn pamphlets. Um, the first couple of months of the Prince debate, it is all about the conduct of the Paxton boys um, and how reprehensible it was how lawless they were, how unchristian they were. Um, and, you know, by the time you get to later pamphlets, once you get to March, April timeframe, it's, it, the, the, the topic has shifted. It's now a, a debate about governance. It's about whether or not the Quakers can ever have a role in government um, in these warring times, um, whether, you know, the proprietors are really fit to govern, which then gets Franklin admired in that debate. Um, so it's moving pretty quickly, but by 18th century standards, you know, again, this, this is not something where it takes three to six months to put something out. And it still does presuppose access to a platform. You know, there are people that are not just deplatformed, they're unplatformed. They still don't have a printer. So in that way, it doesn't really hold up to social media because at least with social media, everybody can get on Twitter, say what they're going to say, maybe they have their account restricted at some point, but they can at least get onto the platform. Hmm. That's, that's, I think, where it breaks down to some degree. Yeah, yeah. Wow, it, it, I mean, the parallels between 
uh, then and now are just so striking in terms yeah. of populist violence. Um, it sounds a lot like today. Um, yeah. I'm also thinking, uh, uh, we have one uh, listener who's asking, what was the, the kind of public reaction to these massacres at the time? Um, was, it, was it muted? Was it clear? Was it, was it universal? And of course, it also depends, I suppose, on where, where you're looking for that information, whether it's Philadelphia, Lancaster, Donegal. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's really a question of which public, right? Um, because, you know, certainly there were lots of um, German uh, Moravians where the wedge issue became a pamphlet that Franklin had put out <laughs> 15 years earlier on uh, the increase of mankind where he calls Germans Palatine boars. That gets resurrected in this pamphlet debate. And then that becomes something that then creates division in that alliance because a lot of those Germans were otherwise sympathetic uh, to you know, sort of diplomacy with native peoples. But once you sort of bring up Franklin's shady history and by association, Franklin's tied up with the, Pac uh, the Paxton critics, then that then colors that perception. Um, you know, I think a lot of it depends on where somebody was based, um, uh, their language. This was a highly um, uh, pluralistic colony uh, where, you know, you're really seeing um, particularly settlers trying to force some kind of coherent white identity in this print debate. Um, they are looking for a way to build that white identity. And yet, you know, Scots Irish Presbyterians, English Anglicans, Quakers, Moravians, they didn't necessarily see each other as allies in a cause, but they could see each other as allies in a cause against the native other. And that's where you start to see some kind of synthesis in a really destructive way. Um, but I think it's an acrimonious debate and that acrimony is captured in those materials that I truly hope people will explore for themselves and, 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 and bring their own questions to bear up. One of the things that your, uh, your work kind of illustrates is the nonlinear nature to history, uh, or the, and, and to put it in a more positive term, uh, this the cyclical or the spiral nature of history. And what I'm thinking about here is, um, well, we have a question from, from one um, person in the chat uh, asking for clarity about the Conestogas. Are they literally with us today or are they with us metaphorically? Uh, and where, where are they now? Um, I don't know how we drill into that question, but um, you know, when, when we look at, I was just reading a book that uh, came out fairly recently about what does it mean to be black? It's uh, Skip Gates and a, and a partner of his uh, really looking into um, genetic structure and how, um, how race is defined and determined. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we learned from that is there are a lot of people procreating across all sorts of artificial boundaries that we um, kind of construct for ourselves. Certainly Native Americans are, are procreating with, with folks who are not Native American. Um, so, I mean, it, it's always been clear to me that, that, uh, that race is just not so clear yeah. and that, and that uh, Native Americans are with us. Um, I'm, how, how we suss that out, I'm not sure, but can you can you offer any clarity to that notion of how do we know, how do we recognize, or how do we tend to the Conestoga, the Lenape who are in our midst today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on, honestly, it's it's really hard to say because um, I don't want to start, you know, asking about, you know, blood quotas or something like that. Right. And, um, you know, frankly, both Lee and Weshoyo have mixed heritage. Um, and yet, they're native, they're native through and through. They are, you know, Lee is Laguna, Weshoyo is Tongva. They've carried on those traditions. And so I think a lot of it has to do with um, habits and, 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 and sort of a sense of, of, of belonging. And certainly when we met with folks at the Circle Legacy Center, we had people that were Seneca, Lenape, and there was one woman that did identify as having ancestors that were Conestoga. 
far be it for me to say that's wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, again, what I know of the Conestoga is that there was a great deal of intermarriage. Um, this was a massive um, uh, tribe. I mean, back when you had Susquehanna, uh, the uh, Susquehanna Forum, going back to the early 18th century, you had hundreds of people living here and they all moved around. So again, I think it's, it's not necessarily fruitful to think about whether you can prove that you know, somebody's descended from that exact group, but there were lots of kin relationships. I think that that's the important thing to recognize. You know, there are lots of people living on Conestoga Indian Town, um, around Conestoga Manor, in the surrounding area, that had familial relationships. Um, and, you know, not all of them can be accounted for in the violence of the Paxtons. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of the story is also about expanding our, our definition and our, our understanding of kinship too, which I think is a, is a very important indigenous intervention that, that Lee makes, you know, really thinking about how you create those communities and how you find your people. Um, and, um, you know, the, the sort of recurring refrain of we're still here, we're still here. Well, the we is expansive and that's beautiful. We want it to be expansive because that's how you create those relationships, which I think are so essential to sustaining those traditions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we're coming close to the end of our time, but um, I wanna uh, kind of broaden the geography for a minute. Um, one of the folks who has been a regular contributor to our regional history colloquium, and we are, you are the last speaker in our 25th year of the Lancaster County Regional History oh. Colloquium. So congratulations to you. Kathy Brown from uh, University of Pennsylvania was the first presenter uh, 25 years ago. So there are our bookends. Um, but, but Patrick Spiro has uh, uh, spoken to us a number of times. And one of the things that he really explored was how on the Western frontier, whether it's Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, there are these flashpoints and these experiences similar to um, the Conestoga massacre. Uh, it's not a unique one-off, um, it, it's happening here and there. And so one of our viewers would love to know, are there resources similar to uh, Digital Paxton and Ghost River for other incidents um, in Native American history either mm. in Pennsylvania or beyond that you're aware of that, uh, that folks could explore? That's such a good question. And I wish I had a good answer for you. Um, again, I mean, like Pat Spiro has done the work. Um, his, his books will, will send you to the collections, but I don't think there are any sort of digital companions that accompany those books, even though they're incredibly scholarly and also readable, which is an unusual talent that he has. He has that talent, agreed. Um, yeah, and yet, you know, here, so fortunately, you took this particular approach to it at a time when, who knew, um, these graphic materials, easily accessible and downloadable, uh, would, would have a way to be shared when we couldn't get together uh, individually and, and, and look at PowerPoints on, on a screen in a, in a room that we're, and we're all familiar to that, um, that routine. Um, I think, Will, this is probably a good place to, to sum things up, unless there's any closing uh, thought that you have that you want to share with our audience. I would just add that I'm easy to find. So please do look me up if you have questions that we didn't get to. Um, uh, I, my, my website's willfenton.com. My email address is wfenton at gmail.com. Shoot me an email. Happy to have the conversation. I love talking about this stuff with people who are passionate. And you folks are not only passionate about it, you're like living it. This is your history. So I really do value your insights and I'd love to hear from you. Well, we've been delighted to hear from you tonight. Uh, we commend you again for the work and for your partners uh, in the work that you've created. We, we look forward to hearing new and kind of uh, equally exciting things in the future. Um, uh, I want to thank our audience uh, for joining us tonight. As Emily mentioned earlier, uh, look for a recording of tonight's lecture on Lancaster History's YouTube channel in the upcoming days. Uh, and as is typical, when you leave the Zoom, a window will pop up. Uh, it'll be a post-event survey. Uh, we'd love to know your thoughts about this program tonight and your ideas for future programming. Um, this concludes our spring selection of lectures. And again, uh, we thank you for attending. We're currently hard at work preparing a great slate of speakers. Uh, to begin in the fall and continue through uh, the spring and early summer. So stay tuned, you'll be getting in the mail your um, 
programs that will be laying out a lot of the activities going on at Lancaster History. So once again, Will Fenton, thank you for your work. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, our audience, for joining us. We wish you all a pleasant evening. Good night. Thank you.